What's the story, Morning Glory? What's the word, Hummingbird? Thank you so much for clicking on my channel and for joining me for this review of Life After Lockup Season 5, Episode 19, Moms Behaving Badly. Let's get started with Justine and Michael. So one thing that I completely missed last week was that Mike had known ahead of time that they were not going to be able to move to Las Vegas because he had already known that there was some document that he was supposed to turn in and he didn't turn in. He had already known this. So because of this missing document, document um it seems like he knew that they were not going to be able to move but for whatever reason he didn't want to tell Justine or the kids until he got the official word from the parole um from the parole office that he wasn't going to be able to move right away I don't know but it seems like either he knew for a fact or he knew there was a high probability of them not being able to move, but he kept that to himself. So he knew there was a problem. Let's just say that he knew there was going to be a problem and he didn't want to tell Justine that there was this problem. I guess he was kind of hoping and praying that by some miracle, the parole officer would still approve his leave, even though he was missing this document that he was supposed to turn in. So... Now he has to confess to her that they're not going to be able to move right away. And as he's telling her this, you know, they're sitting in their living room and there's boxes packed all around them. And he tells her that because of this missing document, they're not going to be able to go. And they're going to have to wait 30 to 90 days uh, before they can actually leave for Las Vegas. I'm still kind of wary of what he's saying. I have a feeling that some something is going to pull through and they're going to be able to leave on time, but maybe not. I don't know. I don't trust this show and I don't trust these people. So whatever they say, I take it with a grain of, uh, with a grain of salt. So she's obviously very upset because she tells him, you know, I had to cancel my C-section and my doctor's appointments because I thought that I was going to be giving birth in Las Vegas. And I think she felt like he should have, that he had the ability to tell her to not cancel anything because I don't think this move is going to happen when we want it to happen because I didn't turn something in so this is what gets her really upset because she says that you know he lied to her or he withheld the truth from her or something like that he one way or the other he was deceptive to her the story seems a little bit confusing to me so I'm beginning to wonder how truthful all of this really is and I also, when Mike and Justine were arguing in this episode, to me, it just seemed a little bit forced. It didn't seem very genuine. It seems like, you know, like it's a plot line. Like this is just for dramatic effects because they've got nothing else going on. Everything else is like working out fine for them. So they have to create some type of drama to make it interesting for people to watch. So they're going to do this whole, oh, I lost the paperwork thing. The dog ate my homework Uh storyline so that there can be some type of drama because I just didn't buy this whole entire scene and how they were arguing it just didn't seem real to me but I don't know so she cancels her she had to cancel her c-section and her doctor's appointments and now she's stuck in Pennsylvania without a doctor without a c-section appointment and this is where we're at. So Mike has a family meeting with the kids and he tells the kids, when I say the kids, I'm talking about her kids. He tells the kids that they won't be able to move to Las Vegas right away. So he explains to them what parole means, you know, that he doesn't have any control of his own life. It's the parole office or the parole board or whatever you want to call it. They're the ones that give him the permission to move and to do this and to do that. So he's basically controlled by this other entity and it's not really him that doesn't want to move. It's just that he's not able to move he doesn't have the permission uh to move right away and i think they asked him well how long are you going to be on parole or something and he says until her youngest kid turns 30 and he's 10 so he's going to be on parole as we all knew this for like 20 years um Mike admits that he wasn't completely honest with Justine. Otherwise, you know, she wouldn't have canceled her C-section. And this is when Justine's daughter steps in and she was asking her mom something. And she was like, you know, so I don't know what she was asking. She was asking her mom something. And Mike butted in and was going to answer the question that she was directing to Justine. And her daughter was like, Mike, Mike, I'm talking to my mom because this house is not ready for a baby she's canceled all of her appointments and so when she said that like with that kind of authority towards Mike Justine was like Kylie Kylie like warning her to kind of tone it down a little bit but I didn't think that she was being that disrespectful and she's damn nearly an adult and I don't think she was being rude to Mike at all she was asking her mom a question and then Mike was going to answer and I'm like what are you doing so 
the youngest uh, child, the youngest, uh, the youngest child says, Mike, this is the very first time that you've ever lied to us. <laughs> But the boys forgive him, you know, they both get up and give him a hug. And when they were hugging Mike, Justine's daughter, Kylie, she got up and, and she walked away because I think she was just so disgusted with the whole situation. I'm pretty sure the girl was looking forward to moving to Las Vegas. She couldn't keep the secret in. She had to tell, you know, Mike's oldest daughter that they were moving. So it seems like Kylie was really, really excited about this move. But now it's been delayed. And I was Glad to see Justine's middle child because, you know, last season, the middle child and Michael were not really getting along. Um, the little the middle child was acting kind of rebellious towards Michael because, you know, Michael was taking up his mother's time. And the middle child was like really trying to mark his territory around his mother and to let Mike know that, you know, I'm her one and only man in her life. And it's not you. So it seems like the middle child and Mike now have kind of warmed up more towards each other because he also gave Mike a hug. So Kylie, she's so upset because of how this is, um, affecting Justine. Um, she gets up, she walks away and this is where we're at. Like I said, something about this just seems like it's just done for television. Like, I'm pretty sure they're going to be moving to Las Vegas way before the 90 days, maybe even before the 30 days. So my, uh, Justine was complaining about how, you know, now they're going to have to pay $4,000 for the new house and also pay rent or extend their lease. And she even asked him, well, how long are we supposed to extend this lease for? And he goes, well, just to be on the safe side, another six months. And she was like, six months? <laughs> I don't know. Mike, you should have been more honest. I don't know what you're doing. Um, withholding impertinent information like this. You really should have been more honest. And you should have told her the what's up. Because, you know, she's pregnant. And you knew that there was going to be a delay in the move. And, like, it's just... <sighs> If this is even true, it's just awful. Moving on to Taylor and Chance. So Taylor's sister and Taylor's friend, they come over and Taylor tells them about the text messages, the 177 text messages that was sent between Chance and somebody else who Taylor claims is another man, but who Chance claims is either another female that was catfishing him, or either another female or it was Taylor catfishing him. So between the hours of 10 p.m p.m. and 5 p.m. 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. there was 177 messages exchanged between Chance and this other person. Chance is sticking by his story. He says I was not text messaging a man. I was either text messaging um, a woman or it was Taylor pretending to be somebody else. So Back at the house, Taylor and her sister and her friend, they get all of his stuff, pack all of his clothes and trash bags and throw all that mess out in the front yard. Chance is supposed to be coming over to drop off her laptop. So four hours later, like he's four hours late, he shows up. And as soon as he uh, like opens the door or as soon as Taylor opens the door, um, he wants to step into the house, but she physically prevents him from stepping into the house. Then her sister and her friend, they come back, they come in for reinforcement to keep him out of the house. And so he's like, you got some man in here. He's trying to fight his way through. They're trying to keep him from coming in. And he's like, I live here. I still live here. And, um, Taylor says, well, you don't work, so you can't live here. And <laughs> I'm like, is that the tenancy law in Missouri that if you don't work, you can't live somewhere? So then Chance tells her, well, if you want me to leave, you're going to have to evict me. Don't you even know the laws? And her friend in the background goes, no, she doesn't. <laughs> you know, like confirming the fact that Taylor's an idiot. So he says that the purpose of him bringing the laptop was to apologize. He was going to take this chance to apologize to Taylor. So because he won't let him inside the house, him and Taylor have to go talk outside. So they're talking outside and, you know, she brings up the text messages and he keeps on telling her, you know, um, I'm, not, I'm not cheating on you. And he says, well, what about you? I know you're cheating on me. And she tells him, I've never cheated on you. And then she brings up some email that she sent to some, I don't know if it was like a male friend of hers but she says that in the email uh the only thing wrong that she did in that email to her male friend was to talk about how good chance was treating her when he really wasn't 
So they go back and forth about this whole cheating thing. He says he's not cheating. She says that she's not cheating, but she still accuses him of cheating. And they go back and forth. And then they start talking about the child. And he says that he still wants to see his son. And she's like, okay, you can still see your son, but I just don't want you popping up whenever you want to. And he tells her, of course, I'm not going to do that. Of course, I'm going to give you like a 24 hour notice before I show up to see my kid. She goes back inside the house and he moves on. He leaves. He goes to his motel or whatever. She goes back inside the house and her friend and her sister tell her, Taylor, you're going to have to get a protective order against him. So she's kind of wishy-washy about that because she talks about how, well, I still want him to come around and see his son. I don't want to be that kind of mom where my son tells me later on in life, you know, you kept my dad away from me and I hate you. And her friend tells her, your son is going to thank you for protecting him from that man. And I'm like protecting the son from what exactly? Like, what has he done to the child? I didn't understand that. So, you know, Taylor was like, no, I don't know if I really want to go through with a protective order. Well, she didn't say exactly that, but that's what she was hinting at when they're like really adamant about you're going to get a protective order. As soon, uh, as soon as you wake up in the morning, we're going to the courthouse, you get a protective order. And she was kind of like, well, mm, I don't know, y'all. And then they got mad at her. They're like, Taylor, this is what we're talking about. You know, you're going to have to stand firm. You know, you cannot go back to that man. So Chance, on the other hand, he's thinking that this is just temporary. He's like, you know what? I'm gonna let her calm down a little bit and we'll be right back together again. Give it about a week. Let me let her calm down for about a week. And um, yeah, we'll be right back together. This ain't nothing. So all I can say is Taylor, girl, you need to find a backbone. You need to make a decision. You need to make a decision because the way Chance is acting with all of this mess that he's doing, all of this sneaky, sneaky stuff that he's doing, this is how he is. Either you're going to put up with it and stay with him or you're going to break up with him permanently because he is not going to change. And my mother always tells me if the other person doesn't change their ways, you need to change. You need to do something differently. So Taylor, I'm not taking another season. If y'all ever come back to this show again, I am not going to tolerate another season of you talking about, oh, well, I decided to give Chance another chance because we have a child to get. Nope. I don't give a damn about none of that. You need to make a decision. Either you're going to stay and put up with the way that he is or or you're going to break up with him permanently. Now, of course, he's got the right to see his child. You know, if y'all can't work that out amicably amongst yourselves, then go to the courthouse and get a visitation order and a custody order. He does have the right to see his child. But as far as you and Chance, I am so sick and tired of constantly, y'all have these huge blowups, these huge dramatic breakups. Because remember last season, she burned his clothes um, in the fire pit. She took all his clothes. This is when, this is when uh, Chance was still a little bit more buff. He still has some type of definition to his body. She took all of his stuff, put him in the fire pit and burned it. They got back together again. And now they're breaking up again. I just, it's like, no ma'am. No ma'am. You need to figure out what you want to do and stick with your decision. Moving on to Melissa and Louie. Melissa tells Louie about, um, she confesses to him that she's already made up her mind that she's going to go through with her nose job and that she's already made the payment for it. Louis upset because he, she did not consult with him first. Melissa tells us that she didn't want to talk about it with him first. She wanted to make this decision on her own because she just didn't want to hear all the noise. So Louis calls her out on being um, a hypocrite he, uh, or the double standard. Sorry. He calls her out for um, the double standard, how she doesn't want him to make any decision without consulting her first, but then she feels free to decide whatever the hell she wants to do without consulting him. So Louis, um, he still has to, so she's already made up her mind. She's going to get her nose job in New York. And of course she wants him to travel with her. So he has to apply for a travel pass. So she, he tells her, this is the reason why you should have consulted with me because I can't be applying for a travel pass at the very last minute. These things take time. A lot of paperwork is involved. So you should have just told me back then, then I would have, you know, had all of that already in motion, whatever. He ends up being able to travel with her. So she tells him that before on their way to New York, they're having a conversation and she tells him that before I go in for my surgery, I have to take a pregnancy test. And she says to him, what do you think about that? 
And he's like, what am I supposed to think about that? And she's like, well, you know, we've been doing it like, you know, uh, like doing it like crazy. We're not, we're not using any protection. So there's a possibility that I could be pregnant. So what do you think about having a child? And he says, I don't want to have a child right now. And she was like, why not? And he was like, cause I'm just not ready to have a kid right now. So then, um, I think this is when she accused him of not wanting any type of responsibilities that he wants to live his life like a frat boy. And I'm like, Melissa, that's a bit of a stretch just because he's being responsible and saying that y'all are not ready to have a kid because y'all can barely get along with each other. You're calling him immature, irresponsible. He just wants to party all the time and be a frat boy because he's making a wise decision or, but then again, Louis, if you don't want to have any children, stop sleeping with her without protection. If you want to be like responsible and be like, Hey, we're not ready for a kid right now. Use protection. If you don't want kids, do the things that prevent having kids. You can have all the sex that you want to have. Okay. From sun up to sun down. Okay, but be careful and use protection. You're not gonna have to worry about having a kid. At least 99% chance of not having a kid. So Louie and Melissa, they're on their way uh, to New York for her story. Like I said that before. Okay, so uh, she says, well, when we get to New York, you know, I want to make a whole thing of it. I want us to go to a nice restaurant, have dinner, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, oh, I got you, girl. I got you. I've got that all planned out. I got a surprise for you. So she's excited about this surprise that he's got planned for them for New York. And the surprise is he takes her to a pizza parlor and she's like, not another pizza parlor (laughs) because, you know, back in uh, Georgia, he was working at a pizza parlor. Now he takes her to another pizza parlor. And this is where he got his first job. I think when he was younger, the owner of the pizza parlor was his very first mentor. So this place is very nostalgic for him and you know it has a lot of meaning to him but it don't mean a damn thing to Melissa she's just like oh god another pizza parlor so he makes the pizza he goes back into the kitchen and he starts making the pizza just like he did in Georgia and he makes the pie and then they're sitting down there eating it and she was like so this was your surprise and he was like yeah this is my surprise and so Melissa's like I understand that this is important to him but I could care less and I don't want to be inside of another pizza parlor so then they start talking about their future and he says well I have another surprise I got a job and she's like oh really where and he says at a pizza parlor so she's like, so you're gonna be working at pizza parlors for the next 20 years of your life. And she also says something in her confessional, like, you know, I cannot believe that he's gonna be working at a pizza parlor, earning the same amount of money as a high school kid. So then he tells her, I can never make you happy. You're never happy with anything that I do. This is temporary until I get something better, but at least it's income coming in. Well, as far as she's concerned, it's not enough income. So she might as well be paying for the house herself because whatever, I guess, you know, chump change or minimum wage salary he's gonna be earning, it's not gonna be enough to help her pay for that new apartment that they're in or that new house that they're renting. So she's not happy about it at all. Um, He feels like, you know, she's always unhappy with him she's never happy with anything that he does and he keeps on telling her it's just you know until I find something better this is not going to be my life I am looking for something better but then when he wants to do something better like he wants to do the um, personal training thing she poo-poo's all over that as well she wants him to do what she wants him to do but then she gets mad at the fact that his mom also controls his life when she does this exact same thing she controls his life even more I think than his own mother does Moving on to Quaylen and Chevelle. So Chevelle, her daughter, her mom and Quaylen's mom, they go dress shopping for her wedding gown. So she tries on because Chevelle told um, the wedding dress, I don't know, coordinator or whatever she is, employee there, that she wanted something very sleek, sexy, form fitting. So the very first dress that she tries on it's exactly that it is form fitting it is sleek it's very very sexy because it's very low cut you know the girls are out and Quaylen's mom was like can you find something that's a little less revealing so she comes back tries on dress number two y'all dress number two was practically identical to dress number one it had the same exact silhouette It had the same exact cut design. Everything was really low cut. The girls were out again. And Quaylen's mom was like, oh, I like that one. And I'm like, it's the same exact dress. 
moving on from there. Now it's time for Chevelle's bridal shower. So she shows up at the bridal shower with um, my, my Leah and everyone's there. Both moms are there, friends and family, cousins, sisters, all these people are there at the bridal shower. So as soon as she gets there, um, Chevelle has a conversation with Quilandria, Quaylen's mom. And Quilandria is telling Chevelle that I don't think y'all are ready to get married. Um you know y'all have a lot of issues a lot of problems and Chevelle says all couples have problems um we're not like you know we're like everybody else we have our ups and downs but this is what we really want to do so Colandra says okay if this is what y'all really want to do then I give y'all my blessings it's okay with me I'm gonna go ahead and support y'all after that she moves on and talks to her mom I don't know if her mom has something to, had a little bit too much to drink because her mom to me seemed kind of tipsy so she goes and talks to her mom and her mom tells her I don't think uh Quaylen's ready to get married and she says you know Quaylen's not ready to get married because I think he still wants to cheat on you he's still out there trying to cheat he's been gone he's been uh, locked up for 12 years so he doesn't have that cheating thing out of his system yet and so Chevelle was like mom you're being really rude right now and her mom goes I'm not being rude I'm being real so Chevelle gets all emotional like mom how can you say that about somebody that I'm going to be spending the rest of my life with you know and then here comes Quilandria to save the day and she sees that Chevelle's upset and so she pulls Chevelle away from her own mother so when that happened her mom got really upset but she's that's my daughter you can't just pull my daughter away from me that's not your kid that's my kid I birthed her your child is Quaylen so the moms are now going at it. People are stepping in, keeping them apart. Um, like they're going to, like they're about to really come to blows. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, here comes Quaylen. Like he just walks on in and he's like, what's going on here? In his, you know, teacher trying to calm down the class voice. And that's where that segment ended. And I'm like, y'all, this segment and uh, this, uh, this segment of Quaylen and Chevelle it's going exactly where I don't want it to go because I'm not interested in the mothers and them not wanting their kids to get married and the two old women fighting constantly. I'm not interested in that at all. But this is what this show wants to give us. So here we are. But this is probably the most um, sober that I've seen Quaylen when he came in there and he had all that thunder in his voice. What's going on here? Moving on to Lindsay and Blaine. Blaine tells her that, okay, so he tells uh, Lindsay that he went to go see the doctor and he's been diagnosed previously. Um, he's been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress syndrome, anxiety, depression. So he went to go see a doctor because he's been feeling very overwhelmed with life right now. You got Lindsay, you know, face from 40 years, her proposing him feeling like maybe they're not ready to get married and all this other stuff. So the doctor prescribed to him medical marijuana, gave him a medical marijuana card. So Lindsay was like, uh, uh, no, mm -mm, we're not doing that. Absolutely not. Number one, we can't afford it. Uh, we're barely hanging on as it is. So we're not going to be doing any of that. So she's completely against it. She's also upset that he went behind her back to try to get the medical marijuana card that he didn't even tell her that he was trying to get that. So then Lindsay later on, she's driving somewhere and she's calling her attorney and she tells her attorney that Blaine got this medical marijuana card. The attorney was like, that is not a good idea. That's not a good idea at all because number one, y'all are ex felons and you know, can't be around drugs, even if it's like prescribed by a doctor because of the fact that they um, have federal convictions. I guess the attorney was like, you know, um, the federal government doesn't even recognize medical marijuana. So I would not advise this at all. And so Lindsay now has to try to convince him to not go through with it, even though this is what he really wants. So not only that, but they are like, kind of like, you know, um, they're really pushing it. Number one, both of them are ex felons, right? So normally you can't have ex felons living together, but somehow or another, you know, they're able, they're able to live together and that's already kind of stretching it now you want to add drugs into the mix so yeah Lindsay was like we're not doing any of that later on Lindsay and Blaine are fixing breakfast in the morning trying to get the kids ready for school and all of a sudden um Lindsay wants to start this argument about Blaine not pulling his weight around the house he doesn't do anything in the house like to help out with the chores 
and the domestic stuff and he doesn't bring in enough money and she feels like she's doing everything on her own she works full time and um she goes to school then she has to come home do laundry cook clean take care of the kids and she feels like she's getting no help from him she says that he's barely pulling in 40 hours a week so he's like i do a lot around this mf da, 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 da. so they're arguing about how much you know is he really doing he claims he's doing more than enough she claims he's not doing enough they're going back and forth back and forth she was frying bacon on the stove all of a sudden he knocked the pan off the stove i hope that you know the bacon wasn't hot but he knocked the pan off the stove and um that's where that segment ended. Once again, I think this is just for TV. I think this is just for dramatic effects. Um, I don't think Lindsay and Blaine are having any issues at all because the argument just came out of left field, just came out of nowhere. And you know, whenever we see Lindsay trying to be all domesticated, I'm not buying it. I don't think a girl cooks like that. I don't think she cooks that much. I think they eat out a lot or order in a lot. I just don't see Lindsay as the kind of woman who's, you know, coming home, rushing home, trying to beat traffic, trying to cook for her kids and her man and do all. I just don't see that at all. So that's why I'm not really buying whatever she was trying to argue about. Moving on to Brittany and Key Rock. So they are in New York to visit Brittany's grandmother. As she's getting ready, Key Rock brings up her mom. Lynn's, uh, Brittany's mom and he tells Brittany I think your mom doesn't like me because I'm from the hood I think last time he even said that I don't think your parents like me because I'm black and Brittany tried to shut that all the way down and she was like it's got nothing to do with your race it's got nothing to do with where you're from they don't like you because you're trans and they have a hard time with me being with someone who was actually born a woman that's what they don't like so stop saying that my parents don't like you because you're from the hood my parents are not like that so she gets really really offended about that and so he keeps on saying that you know, I think it's because I'm from the hood and, you know, your mom, your mom, your mom. And Brittany was like, keep my mother's name out your damn mouth. Stop talking about my mother. I already told you. Stop talking about my mom. Once again, this is played up for the cameras. I didn't understand why she was being this overly dramatic when he didn't even say anything bad. He didn't even say anything wrong. All he was giving was his opinion on why his why her mom doesn't like him. I didn't, and she was like, she flew off the handle. She got up. She stormed into the bathroom. She's telling the camera crew, you know, get out of here. Get out of here. And I'm like, because he's giving you his opinion on why your mom doesn't like him. I was so confused because in, on the one hand, she's defending her mom. And on the other hand, she's, you know, accusing her mom. Because she's talking about how she hasn't seen her mom in six years. Her parents refuse to see her. They don't want nothing to do with her because she's with K-Rock and I was like, well, you're doing the most. And the, re the real reason why I think this was just for the cameras was because I had caught one of their lives on TikTok um, and they were out to eat and someone had asked them, um, are you and K-Rock, are you and K-Rock still not getting along or something like that? And she goes, of course we're getting along. You know, that's just for TV or that's just TV. So I was like, okay, this is just for dramatic effects. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Moving on to Sarah and Sean. Sean, Sean, my little honey bun. I'm going to need you to do something about that mustache. It is too, it reminds me of the wrong <laughs> historical figure. I'm going to need you to do something about that damn mustache. Grow it out more, okay, or just shave it all off completely but that little patch that you got right here that ain't it that is not the look okay i'm gonna need to do something about that sarah tells us that anthony um her daughter's father abby's biological father has stopped coming around to see abby so she needs she wants to get to the bottom of it she thinks that he's back on drugs and she's talking about this with her mom and her mom was like well if he's back on drugs he will never see abby again and sarah was like yeah i know so she wants to meet up with anthony and she wants to give him a drug wants to give him a drug test in case he does express interest in still seeing abby she wants to make sure that he's clean so they're supposed to meet up somewhere and um she arrives at the restaurant and he was a no call no show she called him texted him no response so now she's like really sad because 
she feels like now he's really out of Abby's life, either because he's going to just not show up anymore or because she's not going to let him see Abby until they have this conversation and he takes this drug test. So she was, you know, boohooing over that. It's really, really sad. I don't have anything to say about it. It's just really sad how he came into her life and we saw how happy Abby was to have her father back in her life. And now he's, you know, skedaddled right out of it. And Sarah was feeling really, you know, bad about herself because Sean told her that this is not, he's not going to stay. He's going to get back on drugs. This is not a good idea to bring this man back into Abby's life. I'm her father. I should be her only father, but Sarah didn't want to listen. So it's a very sensitive topic. So I'm not going to say too much about it. And I'm just going to end it right here because it's already been 30 minutes. Thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it on your way out. Please don't forget to rate the video if you like this content. Please subscribe to my channel and I'll definitely talk to you later. Bye.